We have some big flare players in Earthview, some fake out solar storms, and some big regions to watch on the sun's far side. Those stories and more are in this week's Spotlight. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is picking up in activity quite a bit. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have region 4105. That's been a big player for us, but it's now rotating to the sun's far side. However, it's not done with us yet, so we'll be talking about that in a minute. Meanwhile, we also have the fast wind from this coronal hole. This coronal hole has been giving us decent fast wind every solar rotation for more than six months. But sadly, it now we're beginning to see that northern edge of the coronal hole kind of retreat to higher latitudes. And so we're not in the path of this fast solar winds nearly as well, and it's kind of underperforming. So sorry, Aurora photographers, but likely that's gonna continue to be the case. Really what the big story is this week is this cluster of regions here. Now it started off with region 4111, right about the 14th, you see it kind of launch a solar storm connected to this filament here. We're seeing a lot of that. A lot of these filaments are kind of erupting when we get these flares from these bigger regions. But it's been pretty much a fake out. This one really, it, even though it's in the Earth strike zone, it didn't send much to us that was Earth directed. So we've gotten a little bit of a bumpy ride, but that is all. Now, starting on the 14th, it's region 4114 that really begins to grow quite rapidly. This region begins firing off big solar flares. In fact, on the, you'll start seeing big solar storms launching from it too. But sadly, here's one right there. Sadly, again, even though they look like they might hit Earth in coronagraphs, they really aren't all that big a deal. So they're going up to the north or even some of them are connected to the eruptions that are occurring on the sun's far side. And we'll talk more about that when we look at our full sun map. But uh, meanwhile, as this region continues to grow, it continues to fire big solar flares. Here's the biggest one right here. This was an M8.7 class flare. And then it also launched a solar storm. And again, when we look in coronagraphs, it really looks promising, but this was actually partly far-sided because it was connected once again to a filament eruption on the sun's far side. So once again, another fake out, despite being in the earth strike zone, it's just not letting off anything that is gonna give aurora photographers any treat. But as we take a look at the HMI imagery to give us an idea of the magnetic complexity, I wanted to show you how quickly region 4114 and 4115 have been growing, especially 4114, which is right here in the inset, this is 4115 over here. You're going to see this red region really begin to spin off like a little hurricane. You can even see it twisting and writhing as it comes up. That's when we started getting the big solar flares. You can see here on the 15th, watch it pulled up like this. Boom, there's the big M-class flare. Look at this thing begin to spin off and pull away from this main cluster. And then we get that X-class flare right about, let's see, where is it? Boom, I think that's it right there. And, and because of that, uh, you know, it, it, as this region begins to pull away, this was pretty much the last big flare that we had, and things have been kind of dying down a little bit since then. And it looks like much of this, uh, you know, much of the complexity is kind of evening out a little bit. It doesn't look like there's going to be a lot much, a lot more of big flares uh, from this region, at least over the next few days. And we'll talk about why that is in a sec. And, uh, and to do that, we have to come back to the main disk because we're going to talk about 4105. This is how this region comes back into play. As we move to the uh, west limb of the sun, watch region 4105 suddenly get very busy. Whoosh, there's a nice big solar storm. Even the, the filament that we've been watching for a long time, it finally launches. Once it's right in this you know, west limb longitude, what I'm calling a hot longitude. And so what I'm wondering is whether or not once this cluster of regions rotates to that hot longitude, if we're going to start seeing them pick up in activity as well. So this cluster of regions may not be done yet. It may kind of die down as it moves through here and then picks back up. So we're going to be paying close attention to that. But watch region 4105 as it continues its fireworks. You're going to see some incredible fireworks from this region. 
Of course, we are still seeing stuff from here, and I am worried about this filament as well. Let me just mention that. This filament is still hanging on, despite the fact that it's gotten activated in quite a few places. It's still there, but if it does launch over the next few days, this could be an Earth-directed solar storm. So we're waiting, we're just watching, but take a look again back at this region. It has just launched so many incredible eruptions on the sun's far side over the last few days. It's very surprising. I ended up having to take a look at stereo data, which, I'll, which will come up here in just a second as this thing continues to rotate through. Here we go. Here's some stereo data. So this is region 4105. You can see it because it's on the edge of this coronal hole. And watch this thing fire. Boom, right there, there's one. Boom, there's two, three. So there's at least two or three big eruptions back to back to back from this region on the sun's far side. So we're going to be watching it very closely. And like I said, when these regions begin to rotate to the west limb, we start, we may start seeing some big uh, eruptions from them as well and radiation storms as well. So we're going to be uh, paying very close attention. And then in about two weeks, we're going to start seeing some fast solar wind from this coronal hole. I know it's kind of hard to see, but you can see a little bit of it as it rotates into Earth view. This is going to definitely give Aurora Chasers a chance to get some decent fast solar wind. So Aurora is coming, even if we don't have any Earth-directed solar storms, but we're going to have to wait maybe about 10 days. And now switching to our full sun map, we take a look at our full sun using SDO AIA imagery in red. That's what you see here for the sun's front side. And then solar orbiter EUI imagery all in blue here. So it shows the sun's far side. And this is so we can get an idea of what's lurking on the sun's far side, even uh, if we can see solar eruptions, which I'll talk about in just a second. But to calibrate you first, I want to make sure you see where here's region 4114, 4115, and 4111. On the sun's front side, you can also see region 4105 as I set this in motion. So as the west limb begins to overtake region 4105, you can see right here, there ends up being on the 16th, if we can wait for it, you'll see right there. Do you see this? I'll back up just a little bit so you can see it. So when we had, we have this big long filament on the sun's far side. This is part of that filament that ends up lifting off on the 16th. You'll see it here. You can actually watch this thing peel off. Look at that right there. You can actually see the ribbons. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying we're having a lot of filament eruptions on the sun's far side that we don't see in Earth's side. But in coronagraphs, it makes it, it fakes us out, making us think that we're having Earth-directed solar storms launching. And that's just not the case. But as you can watch here, as we move into the, the regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days, you're seeing a new region emerge right there. So that's interesting. We're going to see whether or not this is going to become another set of big flare players that enters into view. And then look on this side. Look at but just behind the west limb of the sun. Look at region 4105 just flaring away. This thing is going to be very fun to watch on the sun's far side. We might get a couple full halos uh, because if because this region is so active. So be aware of that. If we get big full halos over the next few days, it might not be Earth directed. It might be another fake out from this region right here. So both stuff going on in the east limb, stuff going on on the on the west limb, just behind the Earth view. So some exciting times are ahead for us. And amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect those big solar flares to kind of drop down a little bit, but they could pick up again here in the next few days. And now taking a look at our current conditions over the last 24 hours, we switch to our global geochron map. And the first thing we'll take a look at is the DRAP radio blackout meter. This shows how intensely radio blackouts have been affecting HF and VHF radio communications. So you can see a lot of radio communications even over the Western Pacific here. But very shortly, you're going to see a big X-class flare. We watch it right there. Let me back up just a smidge. Look at this. It completely clears out all radio communications, even over half of the United States. So if you are an amateur radio operator and or, or emergency responder and you wondered why you were having issues with uh, HF and VHF radio communications, especially HF, it's much, much worse. Uh, this is the reason why. Even though these big uh, X, this X-class flare and some of these other flares have been reasonably short-lived, they've had some big radio bursts associated with them. So they're really effective at clearing out the uh, radio communication bands. So luckily, that's going to be calming down here over the next couple of days. It may pick up again as those regions rotate to the west limb. We shall see if it hits that hot longitude. But for right now, Hopefully these radio blackouts are calming down quite a bit, especially now that we're getting into hurricane season. We kind of need those radio contacts, don't we? All right. Now, as we switch to our roti, we'll get to that in just a second. You can see another, another set of these pops. It just doesn't quit. 
So if we switch to roti, you can actually see we're getting a little bit of, of noise here on the day side. Not so bad. Most of the noise is on the far side. And we're getting a little bit at the poles. So roti is a little bit more active than normal, but not too bad. And then as we switch to ovation, sadly, here we are with the aurora. We're just not seeing the level of aurora that we'd like to get. And this is because that fast solar wind just isn't doing much for us. It's really underperforming. So aurora photographers, if you've been wondering, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, why you're not seeing much when it comes to the aurora, well, that's not the sun, obviously, because it's your mid, it's your winter. It's just that this fast solar wind is underperforming. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 25th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, and we do have a few minor meteor showers going on right now, well, now is your perfect chance. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating maybe a small glancing blow from a solar storm that is one of those fake outs. Now at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm, or actually they're expecting major storm conditions, but I've kind of downgraded it uh, because I'm not expecting more than just a bumpy ride. But we do have about a 65% chance of a major storm at high latitudes. Now remember, we're also in a fast solar wind stream right now. It's just underperforming. So we could have this activity kind of stretch out through about the 21st before things really begin to calm down. So aurora photographers, really only if you're dedicated should you chase because it's really not all that active out there and it's likely going to stay that way. Now at mid latitudes, well, it looks even worse. Conditions are really only going to get a decent chance for activity right around the 20th when we get that glancing blow. Again, I'm not expecting more than really a bumpy ride, but we could see a little bit of something. Then we're going to be calming down by the 21st. We might pick up again a little bit on the 23rd, but not really expecting any aurora possibilities down to mid latitudes. I could be wrong, but likely things are going to stay pretty calm. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid 100s right now for solar flux, and that's likely going to calm down as we move into the weekend. We are sitting at the severe noise range right now on the dayside radio bands, but again, that's going to flip to moderate noise easily by the weekend. NOAA is giving us about a 75% chance of M class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and about a 25% chance of X class flares at the R3 level radio blackout. Again, that's going to kind of start falling off because uh, these regions are kind of dying down. Now they might pick up again as we move, as they move to the west limb. We'll just have to see. And we've got region 4118. That's a new region that's rotating into Earth view, and it could be a big flare player too. So we'll keep you apprised as to whether or not this might change quite quickly. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Everything is in the green when it comes to radiation storms right now. We are sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. However, we do have about a 10% chance of a radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level. And I'm going to stretch that out at least through Saturday could possibly get into a 15% chance of, of radiation storm risk as those regions rotate to the west limb. It always causes that, that risk to ramp up a little bit. But for the most part, all you frequent flyers, and this does mean air crew and you high-risk passengers, you're all in the green. But make sure you stay uh, aware of those ICAO advisories and take those uh, any changing conditions into your flight plans. So the space weather this week is giving us a bit of a bumpy ride. We do have those solar storms that keep launching, but there's these little mini solar storms and they look to be mainly fake outs. So Aurora photographers, well, if you're at high latitudes, you might get a little bit of a chance starting right around the 20th to get once again, maybe a glancing blow, but likely the Aurora is going to be underwhelming this week. So you might want to sit it out unless you're dedicated. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, we do have those big flare players on the earth facing disc. They are calming down just a little bit. So you might get a little bit of a breather for the next couple days and then things might pick up again, especially with new region 4118 rotating into earth view and uh, that, that hot longitude on the west limb. So just kind of hang in there and, and bear with it. And now you GPS users, well, you know, things aren't too bad. We're not getting a lot of big solar storms on the night side and on the day side, things are calming down at least for the next couple days. So as long as you stay away from those dawn dust terminators and away from Aurora, your GPS reception should be, well, pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.